I can't believe it's been over a year since I posted videos regularly, or somewhat regularly, on YouTube. It's time to let you know what I've been up to. Back in 2022, I started having issues with my mobility due to a deter deteriorating hip. <laughs> on the medical side, I was destined for hip replacement. On the activity side, I had to find something that would grab my interest but not require long walks or carrying camera gear, at least not for a few months. What did I find? Astronomy and astrophotography. I've spent the last 18 months doing a deep dive into the subject, only to discover that I've learned just a small corner of what there is to learn in what can be a very technical hobby. Today's video is to tell you about that, but don't worry, <laughs> it won't be technical. Just a quick ask to hit that subscribe button if you haven't yet. You know the drill. It helps the channel grow. Thank you so much. So, what is astrophotography? Simply defined, it is images taken at night that include one or more objects not found on the surface of the Earth, but rather in the night sky. There are two main challenges for this type of photography, for this genre of photography. Number one, no light or low light. And number two, the fact that the Earth is rotating and constantly moving relative to the sky. Both of these challenges need to be considered. Taking it a step further, there are really three forms of astrophotography. Now, this is somewhat arbitrary on my part, but when I talk to family, friends, or interested groups, it makes sense to describe them in this, in this way. The first category is, to me, more properly named night landscape photography or nightscape photography. This is where you match up an interesting night sky. Usually it involves a Milky Way shot with an interesting foreground. The two can be shot separately, then blended, and the foreground is often painted with the light of a flashlight or a head torch to bring out its features. The end result is a fabulous moody shot of land and sky. Quite often, something human, it could be a person, a couple, a lit tent, a cabin, finds its way into the shot for context and scale. Most of us start with this form of night photography as it is the one that best lends itself to the equipment that we already have. We have to learn some new techniques, such as light painting or long exposures, but we can fairly readily adapt to create some wonderful experiences. Sadly, the need to find foregrounds eliminated this from my recent plans because of the need to hike. But in the past, I've taken my share of these types of images. The second category is an arbitrary one that I find useful, and I call it visible object astrophotography. From our often light-polluted homes, we're not aware of the huge complexity of objects that are in the night sky. Most of us talk about the Milky Way. So here's a couple of interesting facts. The observable universe is estimated to be 93 billion light years in diameter. If you translate that into miles, we are talking about 5.4 times 10 to the power of 23. That is 5.4 with 23 zeros after it. Contained within that inconceivable mass of space are galaxies, nebulas, star clusters, quasars, black holes, and all manner of objects that are both visible and not visible to the naked eye here on Earth. And we can investigate them all with our cameras. When you look up at the sky, you can't help but see the things that you recognize, like the moon, the Milky Way on a dark night, or the constellations. Some smaller objects are visible too, like the Pleiades star cluster or the Orion nebula. If you can see them, you can definitely point a camera at them, and understanding how exposure works, you can capture an image, even of these night objects. 
But there are some special considerations when you try to photograph these objects, and this begins to define the real differences between daytime and night sky photography. The big difference is that it's dark out. Duh! <laughs> Getting enough light from the sky into the camera can be a challenge, especially if you are trying to avoid the bad light of the city and of residential streetlights. Typically, you handle low light through longer exposures, but the next big challenge is equally a problem. The Earth rotates. It is constantly moving. There is no way to get a longer exposure without that movement becoming a problem. So what do you do? This isn't a lesson on how to manage that, but in my case, it meant investing in additional equipment to compensate for that rotation. More on that in future videos. And as we all know, with camera and specialized equipment, it can spiral from there, pardon the pun. More equipment, more automation, more capability. I fell into that rabbit hole big time. Even when you see wonderful objects in the night sky, getting a meaningful photograph of them is hard. You might think you need a super long telephoto lens, but the fact is most beautiful objects in the night sky need a wide angle lens or a short telephoto lens just to fit them in the frame. Lots of beginners start out with a 135 millimeter or a 200 millimeter lens and get fantastic results. Eventually though, you hear or read about the things that you can't see with the naked eye. And that's the third category of astrophotography, also known as deep sky astrophotography. Again, there's a lot of overlap in these categories, but generally speaking, you need specialized equipment and techniques to play in this space. <laughs> Again, pardon the pun. As mentioned, I've spent the last 18 months learning everything I could learn and have just barely made a dent in this area of expertise. This is the area of astrophotography that I spend my time on now. One decision I had to make early because of my limited mobility and my light polluted sky was around how far I would travel to get the shot and how much stuff I would take with me to do so. I deliberately wanted to stay close to home primarily for the reason that clear skies with no clouds or even no heavy moisture can obscure a distant image and they're becoming harder and harder to predict. Imagine driving four or five hours to a beautiful dark sky location only to discover completely dense overhead clouds. I don't have that time or that patience. The two criteria I had to satisfy, I had to adopt techniques that would work in light polluted skies and I had to minimize the size and weight of anything I used. This second element is a constant theme for me now, whether it's daytime or nighttime photography. So what was the answer for me? Most of my astrophotography is actually done from my driveway in a light polluted residential subdivision near Toronto, Canada. How is that possible? <laughs> Modern equipment has advanced so far as to give me this as a realistic option. In fact, the timing of my growing interest in astrophotography has meshed perfectly with the availability of automated, optically wonderful, consumer-grade equip equipment that previously would only have been available to universities and research labs. It's actually a perfect time to dip into this hobby and to grow into it. I've had great success with my early work, and here are a few examples. Again, all taken from my driveway. But most of this, I have to say, I have to admit, is the low-hanging fruit that is relatively easy to image. The challenge, now that I'm 18 months in, now becomes the capture of smaller, more faint, and more distant objects with the same fidelity as the ones I've already gotten. And yes, sadly, <laughs> that means more gear. <laughs> more on that in future episodes. So, I'm back and I'm eager to go. As spring emerges here in North America, I hope to be outside both day and night, bringing you new adventures, some hopefully great images, and a little bit of knowledge too. 
Thanks so much for sticking with me, and if you are not yet a subscriber, this is a great time to become one. I truly, truly appreciate you all.